The side chick who stole a married man from his wife and children had him move away, moved in with her, pretended to be his wife, now gets mad at the idea that he's going to leave her for another another woman. She is outraged by this. She pulls out a gun and does two headshots and kills him dead. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm a history teacher and historian, and I like to use criminal cases involving women as the primary killers. Today, we're looking at Fern Dole, who killed her boss and love interest, William. The two told everyone that they were married, but in reality, he had a wife and four children who lived in a different town. So today's case occurred in Michigan in 1930s during the Great Depression era. So we're kind of towards the end of the Great Depression, right before World War II starts. So what we know about Fern is that she grew up in Michigan and she was a model and also a secretary. Now, when she was younger, around 17 or 18, she did get married and had two children, a son named Lester and a daughter named Gloria. But the relationship did not work out and so she ends up getting a divorce. So for a couple years, she works as a model and then she gets a job as a secretary to a lawyer named William, who used to be the former district attorney of the county. They start working together. I think in total, they work together for eight years. But around the second year of them working together, they become lovers and they begin to date. Now, she is fully aware that he has a family. He has a wife named Mabel and they have four children together. So Fern is completely aware of the situation, but she goes, she goes ahead and starts a relationship with him. Anyways, William leaves his family and moves to a different town with Fern and they move in together. And they also tell everyone that they are husband and wife. So everyone in the new city thinks that these two are actually husband and wife. And so they move in together and Fern's children also move in with them. So they're in a relationship for six years. His wife, his real wife, Mabel, and his children know about Fern. They know he's in a relationship with her and they often refer to her as the blonde. So everyone is aware of this relationship. And one of the first things I looked up for this is divorce in the 1930s in Michigan. Like how hard was it? Why didn't his wife divorce him? That you actually could get divorced. And actually probably in the 1920s, the end of 1929, there was like 11,000 divorces. So divorce was actually something that was acceptable and you could do. What you could get divorced for was a little bit harder. You couldn't just say irreconcilable differences. You actually had to prove that there was something going on. And one of the things that I saw was the first thing you can prove was adultery. Was this man cheating? Yes. The second thing was abandonment. Did he leave her for someone else? Yes. Did he move to another city? Yes. So his wife could have gotten a divorce at any moment. Legally, she could have gotten a divorce, but it appears the wife did not want a divorce and wanted him back. Yes, he ran off with another woman. He appears to still be paying his wife all the bills, giving her money and everything else. So he was still supporting his wife and children, but he was just with Fern. I think he and the wife had been married for about 20 or more years. I believe the wife was just waiting for this fling with Fern to kind of run its course and for him to come back home. Six years into the relationship between William and Fern, things started going bad. Probably before that, things were going bad. Basically, William started talking more to his wife, started missing his children. And then one day he tells Fern, I have to go out of town on business. Fern finds out that he's not in business and he's in a hotel room. From what the newspapers were implying, he might've been in a hotel room with someone else, but he never let Fern come up to the room. So she was outraged. Yes, can you believe the side chick who stole a married man from his wife and children now gets mad. She is outraged by the idea that the man she stole from his wife and children is actually leaving her 
to go back to his wife and children. This sets Fern completely off. She is set off and she goes down to that hotel that he is staying in and basically gets him to come outside. They're in the parking lot, arguing back and forth, tells him, you are coming home with me. You're not leaving me. You're coming home. And he is telling her, get away from me. I am leaving you. And she would not leave. She was like, I ain't going nowhere. You are mine. He is trying to get this girl to leave. She is refusing and things are escalating. So he walks to the police station because William was a former district attorney. He's now working privately as a lawyer, but he knows the system. So he goes to the police station. Fern is following right behind him, continuously saying, come home, come home. Do not leave me. Come home, come home, come home. And he's like, leave me alone. They get to the police station. William tells the officers, will you please lock her up? She is a danger. She is threatening me. Lock her up. And the officer said, do you want to file a charge? Do you want to press charges on her? And that's when William says no. And the police said, well, we cannot lock her up unless you're willing to press charges on her. And William was not willing to press charges on her. Um, basically, the police can do nothing for him. He leaves still behind him and they're walking and they're near the police station and he's going back to the hotel and she's still behind him, won't leave him alone. That's when suddenly he starts screaming, get away from me, get away from me. He turns around and punches her in the eye and she falls to the ground and he continues to walk. She gets up, starts following him again and says something to him that gets him to turn around. And when he turns around, she pulls out a gun and does two headshots and kills him dead. She then walks away, comes back and shoots his body twice. I'm guessing she, she wants to make sure he's dead. Not for sure. Once she shoots him two more times, she then goes into the police station that they just left in which William had told the police officers that she was a danger needed to be arrested. She walks into that police station and hands the police officer the gun and says, I shot William. He's outside in the parking lot of the police station. Shot him dead. The police go out there. He's dead. They arrest her. So once she's arrested, they begin to interview her and they said, why did you do this? What happened? And she says that he was abusive to her throughout their six years together, that he was physically and emotionally abusive and would beat her, hit her, and she would leave him. And the officer said, well, why did you come back? And she was like, well, I came back every time because I loved him so much, but he would always beat me, put me down, be emotionally abusive and all these things. And she said that he hit her and she can't remember what happened after he hit her. So she's saying he turned around, swung, punched me in my eye. And that's the last thing I remember what happened. I don't remember anything that happened after that. So they're asking her about the shooting. She does not remember anything according to her. So the police begin to investigate and they come up with a lot of evidence against what she's saying. And what ends up happening is that as they interview William's friends and family and even other people at the police department, they do see signs of abuse, but it's towards William. So they do, they bring in witnesses who say, you know, he talked about how if something happened to him, she probably did it. And people were like, well, then why don't you leave her? And he was like, she just follows me. I can't stop this relationship. She's become very obsessive. So they have his friends and everyone saying that he was attempting to leave her because of her obsessive behavior and things like that. Then you have other cases at the police station where William had to drive to the police station because she had a gun and she held the gun up to his side the whole way that they were driving. I guess they were driving back from seeing his children or something and she was threatening to kill him. He drives to the police station. He got the gun away from her, went and told the police what happened. The police once again said, do you want to press charges on her? And William said, no. 
So then the police said, okay, we'll take the gun. They took the gun and they disposed of the gun. Another time they come to the police station, William is scratched up completely. Like the side of his face and everything is all scratched up and he's bruised and everything. And she's with him. Fern is literally with them every time they go to the police station because of a domestic violence issue. And the police once again say, what do you want us to do? Do you want to press charges against her? And every single time William said, no, he was like, oh, she has children. She can't, you know, she can't be away from her kids. And so the police said, well, there's nothing we can do if you're not going to press charges. And this happened at least three to five incidences where he is coming to the police. He wants them to lock her up, but because he's not providing, because he is hesitant to press charges against her, the police can't lock her up. And so it's this awkward situation that he's in. And remember, this is the time period before like restraining orders and things like that. So he really, his only option was to press charges and risk her going to jail for a year or two. And then where are her children going to go and, and stuff like that. So he was stuck in a very hard situation. So all of this is revealed through the police investigation that there is abuse, but it seems to be directed at William and not necessarily he abusing her. So the district attorney decides to move forward with the trial. And so at the trial, she has a very interesting defense. I, I never heard of a defense like this before. Basically her, de her defense is insanity from being punched. That when William punched her, which she did have bruising. So that appears to really have happened. When he punched her, he, he created something called punch drunk. So it's like she went into a drunken state where she was not aware of her behaviors and things like that. So they, they literally called it punch drunk. He hit her. All of a sudden she's basically a drunk person. She's woozy on her feet and things like that. And the emotion added with the emotional distress and she blacked out and she killed him. It was insanity. It was beyond her. She was just an abused woman. Um, and she had been harmed and that was basically their defense. Now they brought in psychiatrists and everyone else and they debunked this defense. They were like, there's no such thing as being punched and then being in a drunken state. And if she was in a drunken state, every shot they made was accurate. Like, you know, drunk people, they sway, they, they can barely see and, and their bullets go wherever and they miss. She did four shots and she never missed once. She was extremely accurate head shots and then a body and then two body shots. So for her to say that she was in a drunken state from the punch, her behaviors and movements and things like that did not demonstrate it. She was very accurate and very aware of what she was doing. And so needless to say, she was found guilty. And also all of the evidence from the police to friends and neighbors and everyone else that testified against her saying she was actually the aggressor a lot of times and William felt trapped. And when he tried to leave her and go back to his wife, she made it very difficult for him. And one of the things that's interesting is that when Fern talked to all of the reporter reporters and everyone, she was angry towards all the witnesses. She was like, they're all liars. They're just lying all of them, like that was, she was overly focused on that. Like they were all lying. And um, she also had her daughter testify. Her daughter was 15 at this time. And she wanted her daughter to testify to the fact that he was abusive and all of this other things. And it appears that the jury really didn't believe the daughter's story. Like it didn't, it wasn't emotional. She, it, it didn't make sense. And it seemed like she was coached to what to say. And when the prosecutor would question her on things like, well, how often did he hit her? And then she couldn't really say anything. And she was trying to avoid saying that my mom hit him and things like that. So the daughter's testimony actually worked against the mother, even though that was supposed to be the testimony that proved that she was an abused woman. It actually didn't work in her favor. So uh, at the end of the nine day trial, she was sentenced to manslaughter and got 
for a minimum of 14 years and the maximum of 15 years. So she got 14 to 15 years. In the state of Michigan at the time, the max you could get for manslaughter was 15 years. So basically the judge gave her the max. And what's interesting about the case is that all the lawyers involved in their closing statements all use passages from the Bible. Like the prosecutor was like, and remember the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And then the defense was like, oh, well, this part of the Bible says that, you know, and so they kind of went back and forth with Bible verse. It was like the dueling Bible verses. Who can have a better Bible verse? What was interesting about this story is that about this tr true case is that we see men having abuse. And we also see the lack of systems in place to protect people from obsessive lovers or spouses. You know, this is nowadays if a woman is or a man is beat up really bad and the police see it, you don't necessarily have to press charges. But a lot of times with cases like that, if they don't testify, the case basically is just dropped. And so even in modern times, we do see where uh, an abused spouse is put in a very hard position. They either press charges and then this person goes to jail, could lose their job, not able to support their kids. Or if they don't press charges, now they're becoming victims of the situation. So it's just really interesting to see how we still have a lot of issues like this occurring even today in the United States. That is all for today. I am Angela and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Women That Kill and I will see you next time. Ciao.